Boom. You heard it. This is the podcast that is not worried about your feelings. This is the unfiltered, unscripted conversation about all things agency ownership, life, and of course, agency sales. This is the best damn agency podcast. I am your host for these glorious 60 minutes, JJ Russell. Joining me as always, the man himself, Joey Wesley Gilkey. What's up, dude? How are you? Good. I'm stressed. <laughs> kind of like what you. are you stressed about? Um, just all the things. You know, your when your plates get full, you just kind of like, oh, there's no room on my plate anymore. Mm. But uh, all good things, all all um, white male wealthy privileged <laughs> things. <laughs> Perfect. Are you uh, are you feeling your fragility yet? My fragility? I don't have fragility. <laughs> there is no such thing in my world. Okay, well, I, so I've got a couple questions to kick this off. One of them I was okay. thinking about, I went for a walk. I was out there Good. just dr- dreaming, thinking for this podcast specifically. Mm. And um, I know that we're, we're like 100-something episodes in. And so my question was... Um, for those who are listening, who've been listening with us for 100 plus episodes or who just maybe started listening for the first time, we, we, you know, we label ourselves as the only podcast not afraid to hurt your feelings, the no bullshit <laughs> you know, conversation about life, yeah. sales, whatever. What is your hope for the people listening to this podcast that they would ultimately get from this? Uh, my hope is uh, that you don't live a life of silent desperation. And what I mean by that is I think oftentimes people don't have a very clear path forward. They don't have good mentors. They don't have good advice. And they're just kind of stuck in the way of doing things. And I hope that when they listen to this podcast, um, whether it be through entertainment, education, or whatever, that they would that there'd be a little bit more clarity moving forward in life, whether it's just one thing Mm. they need to do different, one tactic they need to try, one strategy they need to implement. My hope is that uh, you have purpose behind what you do and what we do helps you give a little more clarity behind that purpose. So that'd be a good, you know, off the top of the head and that's the top of the dome thought, but it's pretty solid. Yeah, you have yeah. that written down. Is that like on a? It's on a teleprompter on the other side yes, of the screen. Yes, my uh, my teleprompter that I use for all 150 episodes. <laughs> your, your wife is sitting there holding up uh, like giant note cards of what you need to say next. Yes, like everything we've ever said has been scripted, like sex robots. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought you weren't going to say sex robots again on the I show. I could say sex robots. I just might not play with them anymore. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I just won't go into a deep dive on what we, you know. That's, it's actually our new company. <laughs> it's actually, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We artificial only intelligence. Build sales operations for sex robot companies. <laughs> That's right. That's, That's right. Vertical. What about you? What do you think? Um Yeah, I think you might have said a lot of these things. Mine was about like you, I think you said cutting through the noise. It's like there's a thousand people out there telling you what you should think. Yep. I think all of those things result in you being a mediocre sex robot. Totally. Robot. Um, I have massively benefited from thinking for myself and thinking for myself. And I think, you know, the ability to come to my own conclusions, not be overly afraid to offend and hurt feelings, but really, I mean, like with empathy and tact and those kind of things, but ultimately like, to come up with core convictions and beliefs and things that I believe yeah. are true and then not be afraid to speak those things. I think that that's what I would hope for people that are listening. And so like that pertains to business, um, come up with some founding principles, yeah. maybe it's sales. Like maybe you need to believe that sales can work for you and you just need to commit to some basic principles, but also in life, like what are those things that are, that are the foundational pieces of what you're doing on a day-to-day basis that are, that are true to you and true for mm-hmm. you and not something that somebody else is spoon feeding you. Well, yeah, the thing, like don't take things at face value. You know, we had talked about uh, a long time ago. We we like threw out an idea of doing a podcast called Question Everything. Oh yeah, I like that one. I still like that idea. Maybe we'll do it one day. But um, <clears throat> what if Question not- Everything was a 
weekly segment of our other podcast idea. Oh, that's a cool idea. The I question like everything. We can't even get like to that. either because we have no time in our life. But <laughs> nonetheless, whatever we do, yeah, question everything. I think that's important. I think that you need to be able to think for yourself, like you said, and develop and formulate convictions. And even things that you feel strong on, you should question things around them. Because people are like afraid of questioning, like being Christians, right? Or being people of faith. Mm. Like we have this fear of questioning our faith. And I think that questioning, Dude. all it does is it solidifies and it strengthens your convictions. Because if you, if, you, if you avoid questioning, then you always have this feeling of doubt or uncertainty in the back of your head. Mm-hmm. But when you attack questioning head on, you run those things to ground. And if you come out the other side still believing that which you thought you believed in the front end, then that conviction is that much stronger. Can I give you a perfect example? Totally. Okay. So I have worked at mega churches. Yes. And I have stood in the auditorium with the thousands of people and the rock music and the lights and the compelling vision casting pastor on stage and all of the things. Totally. Fast forward a few years, I have none of those things. Yes. And I'm not a part of any of those things. Um, and so I had this picture in my head of like what this transition that's happened to me as it pertains to my beliefs uh, and like, you know, my faith. And it's like, well, you pull away the lights and the music and the sound and you pull away the crowd the and the chairs and the emotion and the speaker and all the things. And all I am left with is myself in a dark room. And what I do or don't believe to be true. Um, It is a lot easier to believe something when there is all the momentum in the world and all of the collective group think in the world, like chanting that that thing is correct. Mm -hmm. But when, but when you get locked kind of in a room by yourself and you're forced to wrestle with really hard questions, it is both an incredibly uncomfortable place to be, but probably the actual place that you need to be to yep. solidify whether or not you believe those things or you just wanted to fall in with the crowd who said they did. Right. Where'd you come out on the so, other side of that? That's a great question. Still figuring it out? I, <laughs> no, dude. I, yeah, I'm, I'm wrestling in like the best okay. way. But I... Um, you said it really well. Like, So I have professed faith in mm-hmm. Jesus for 12 years. Maybe, maybe 13. Me too. No. Um, me too. And I think part of that story for me was this wrestling with like, is there any way there's really a God? Like, is that actually possible? You know, like, yes. And I came to the conclusion that it was, but I came to that conclusion alongside of a lot of other people that really passionately believe the same thing. Right. Yes. Um, 13 years later, I still have those questions. They've just been drowned out by all the, by all the noise. Right. And so now that, the noise is gone. The questions are still there. And I think I'm, I'm being forced to wrestle with like, what does me and God, what does me and God in the dark room, you know, like when it's just the two of us look like, and it's an yeah. uncomfortable question. Is he there? Is right. He, is he listening? Uh, 100%. Sorry. Am I, did my screen freeze? Yeah, but your voice didn't. You're good. I think what happens is for whatever reason, my phone's not connected to the Wi-Fi, but when I get a text message, my... Oh, uh, the EMF that runs off your phone interrupts the mm, Wi-Fi. You need Ethernet, maybe. Anyways, maybe, keep going. Yeah. It's a good well, thread. Anyways. This isn't a faith podcast. Yeah. But it's probably something we all wrestle through in some way, shape, or form, so it's good. Okay, so somebody called this to me recently, uh, Faith in the Wild. Mm, I like, like it. What is faith, what's Faith in the Wild look like? And Probably I've a seen book it that, now. Uh, What's his name? John Eldridge would write or something. Yeah. <laughs> Wild at heart, <laughs> faith in the wall. Um, no, but I've seen a couple guys. So like for uh, here, let me, let me end with this. And this is, I'll sum it up. I, I lived my life as if the answer to that question was I, I decide my future and I decide my purpose and I decide my direction in life. And there's nothing bigger than me. And mm. I'm just going to make the decisions that I want to make. And I lived that way for two years. Yep. And I got everything that I set out to get from the beginning. And I was a miserable human being. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so. Yeah. So. True. However. 
the question on that is, is I'm assuming you're talking about the past two years. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Accomplishing all your goals. Yeah. You, you could potentially also make the argument that you're basing your last two years off your last three months. Maybe I think, I think it still comes down to like, if there's nothing bigger than me, if there's no purpose mm. bigger than mm. me, if there's no, right? Like if there's, yeah. if there's no grander purpose in life, that's bigger than me. What the, I mean, the end result of that is like a really self-serving mindset. That's only consumed with me. And that's a really totally. empty and lonely place to be. And so uh, yeah. I think if it, you know, so Christianity boiled down to principle is like, love others like I've loved you, right? Like the, the biggest commandment is to love other people and to be concerned mm-hmm. for and with them. And I think I think there's purpose in that, you know, whether it's community or it's my family or it's my wife, like to pivot my attention away from myself and towards mm-hmm. other people gives a whole different kind of energy and passion and purpose to, to my life. And so yeah. I have seen people living that out recently in a way that I had not seen before. And I'm like- That's cool dude, this is like, I'm, they've got something that I don't have. Uh, and so it forced me back to that dark and empty room where I had to decide what I actually believed was true about life. So yeah, it's big time. That is the answer to your question. It's a great answer. <laughs> I'm still wrestling myself. So you have good a barn thoughts. you can go to. It's a good dark room. You have a what? A barn. I, yeah, it goes. What was that? What was I doing? I s- <laughs> scream expletives into the, into the ethos. <laughs> I I have not tried that yet, at least to that magnitude. And I think that I need to go scream some expletives into the universe. Um, <laughs> What'd you say? You just had to. You just had to say I quit one time out loud just to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, see, I came upstairs. I had just. I just hired somebody, fired somebody, talked to a disgruntled client, and then had somebody else on our team shit on the work that I spent the last three months doing. And I walked upstairs and I told my wife, I said, I don't mean this, but I'm going to say it really loud one time. I fucking quit. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. Uh, I've said that about my own company, so. It's all right. Here's what it is. We're not the only... We're not the only people that have ever been through that. So no, and we're only just playing business, grand scheme of things. It's it a, game. a game, playing a game, mm. and you can get off the game board anytime you want. But it's true, it's a game. Tell me this, then we're gonna pivot, but not super hard. Um, we are friends. We work together. Mm-hmm. You run sales. Mm-hmm. I run delivery. Yes. <laughs> when when do things break? <laughs> like when when do we fight? <laughs> when do we when do we find ourselves in your barn screaming at each other instead of the universe and <laughs> wrestling in the in the mud? Um uh, I don't know. I don't think you really do. I mean, I think that there's a level of humility when you work with family or friends that you have to possess on both sides of the equation or both variables in the equation, I should say. Um I don't know. I think it's uh, one, it comes down to, I mean, we're lucky that we have like meeting structures and process and accountability and employees that are all doing different things. And so, yeah, there's like the ever, ever tense uh, or ever present tension, if you will, of um, sales pushes the boundaries of delivery. And simultaneously, delivery can also dictate sales in some ways. Like for us, we had a guarantee. Sorry. We realized that the guarantee <laughs> made for the worst types of clients, which made selling harder. And so and now we're in that. So like there's always this tension of you're trying to, you're all part of the same mission and goal, but you're also each fighting to like be able to do your job excellently without boundaries. It's a lot like marriage, not to just keep this illustration going, but like, my wife's home with the kids all day. I'm like, mm-hmm. babe, you literally get to take naps whenever the baby sleeps. Like, I don't want. We had an argument the other day because uh, I, I was like, I'll say that sounds like, like a fight I don't want to have. <laughs> well, and I, she basically was giving me a hard time for like laying on the floor after bed time or after dinner time. I was like, I'm exhausted. I just laid down in the middle of the living room and like wasn't helping with anything, <laughs> which probably wasn't the best thing to do. Sure. I'm like, but you take naps all the time. <laughs> so it's true. My wife's probably taking a nap right now. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a world where like, just like with her, we're both kind of like 
angling for our own space and our own objectives and goals and stuff. It happens in business too, but it can work. It does. That's the hard part. The good thing is, is if you have a good relationship, you have accountability, you have like, I think the good thing too is neither of us are ever going to not speak our mind. Like that's one reason why like my wife and I, like we have some explosive conflicts or at least historically we have. And, um, but the good thing is, is we get them all out there and you know where the person stands. It's, it's why like, equating this to like our sales process where we have like a roadmap that diagnoses where they're at. Mm-hmm. It's like, if you don't know and you can't put a pin in the map of where your potential client is and they don't know where they currently are or vice versa, then it's hard to put together an actual turn by turn that gets you where you want to get to. Yep. Right. Cause it's yep. like, if you don't know where you're at and you're like, take your first left, it's like, yeah, but am I in Florida taking a left or am I in Texas? <laughs> Cause that's going to end me in two different places. For sure. And so I think that's the good thing too is if we're always communicating and, and having that that thing, then we understand where people are at and we can deal with things as they come because we're at least aware. It's when the it's when Love you it. have things that are like fuming. Built up over time. Built up, swept yeah. under the rug. That's why like I think passive couples, though they fight less, are typically the ones who you end up seeing get divorced. They're, they're, yeah, because they secretly are just harboring like this. Yeah, they're harboring list issues. Of, they're not yeah. any different. They don't feel any different than you do. They're just how they express it's different. And it usually doesn't lend to a very healthy marital conversation. I've got couples that I really respect that are 20 years older than me. And they're like, well, I say I really respect them. This makes me respect them less. They're like, we never fight. Yeah. It's tough. I'm like, fuck you. That's not true. That's <laughs> either, say. Either, either your relationship's terrible or. I don't know. Or, or you're, al- you're aliens. Yeah. Or you don't talk, which I guess means yeah. your relationship's terrible. No. Um, so how do we do it? I don't know. I think all the things I talked about, plus mm. humility, plus realizing we all play very important roles and we're just trying to do our jobs as best we can. And so, mm. yeah, I like easy. it. We, it easy we've being. talked a lot of existential things, uh, next level thinking Another place that you could find some next level thinking about your sales operation mm. and potential growth for your agency would be the sales driven agency. That's right. Sales driven agency brought to you. Well, this episode, I suppose, is brought to you by sales driven agency. So we don't run ads on here. We don't take money from other people. We prop up our own shit because our own shit pays for this shit. The podcast mm. that's your little ears are listening to this melodic sound of my voice. So sales driven agency. Uh, has kind enough to sponsor this. And so Sales Driven Agency, what we do is we build out sales operations for digital agencies. So that's why we have the Best Damn Agency podcast. We know agencies better than anyone else. I challenge you to try to challenge that thinking. But what we do at SDA is we build out a predictable self-run operation. This is a fucking terrible ad read, by the way. What's a self run? <laughs> <laughs> so what happens sometimes when you go top of the dome? This is just what I do. <laughs> oh, this is great. Keep going. You're doing I'm good. Just, I'm doing great, guys. <laughs> what is sales driven agency? We build out a sales operation. What is a sales operation, and why does your agency <laughs> need it? A sales operation is sales process. How do you get predictable, repeatable outcomes? Sales people. How do you hire the people? Train the people. Manage the people that run those processes to get you predictable, repeatable outcomes. And then finally, the last piece and pillar is sales enablement. How do you equip and enable those people to run those processes to help you run a predictable, sustainable, scalable agency that is not dependent on the agency owner to grow? I know a lot of you guys are still selling. You're the agency owner. Business is dependent upon you. If you go away, growth goes away. If you take a vacation, growth stalls. If you sell and then you get involved in delivery, your pipeline dries up. What we do is we help remove from you the the necessity uh, to grow your agency, accomplish your goals. And so work with Sales Driven Agency and we will build out the entire sales infrastructure for you, alongside of you, and we'll get you out of sales while also not compromising growth. Uh, Check us out, www. Holy shit, this is terrible. (laughs) (laughs) www.salesdrivenagency.com. Oh, so good. Ooh, nice Was job. it though? <laughs> have you uh, have you seen that video of the of the reporter? <laughs> it's a lady. It's a female reporter. She's standing outside of the. Uh, I think it's the Clippers Stadium. Uh, 
and she's doing some kind of like news spot and she has a, like a stroke on air Holy and shit, she's like blah, 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 blah. like her words like stop making sense 10 seconds into your ad read i'm like what the fuck is joey doing What's right doing now and I, <laughs> and I pictured that lady and then i couldn't stop laughing oh man have you seen the so there's a, that reminds Ooh. me of this video of this guy who's in like middle of nowhere south carolina or something and he's like reporting it's this black reporter and yeah. he's like he's kind of more like put together and he's talking and yeah here at this field behind me and then a bug flies in his mouth and he goes god damn it this motherfucking godforsaken country what the fuck are we here <laughs> and you're like oh that pivoted quickly <laughs> I've, I've seen he's like let's get out this country motherfucker he's like, yeah. <laughs> shit That's flying awesome. in my mouth That's basically how i felt the fly flew in my mouth while i was doing that ad read yeah, if you guys want to figure uh, out your sales shit, have salespeople selling for you, have predictable growth, come to salesdrivenagency.com. Okay, bye. We, we do stuff. Tagline. All right, let's talk about sales stuff. So right. let's say somebody pulled you in tomorrow. They're like, hey, Joey, we've got a, we got a sales operation. we got some salespeople. We're not really getting the results that we want. Um, we want to get an outside expert's eyes on everything so they can come back with like, some data points on what needs to be improved. Yep. But it's it's not them. You're not coaching them on how to do it. You are coming in to do this assessment. Where would you start? What data would you want to see? Like what would give you the quickest read on what needs to change? About an existing sales operation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we're assuming they've tried building something. They have stuff. They've got stuff. Okay. Um, I probably, well, I, one, I'm going to gather your market and your business. So I'm going to say, hey, what's your revenue at? What's your net profit margin? Who do you serve? Like, what's the specific TAM, total addressable market? What's an average deal size? Cool. Great. Uh, that'll take two minutes after that. I'm going to say, great. Who's selling, you or salespeople? If it's you, then we're going to have a conversation. If it's salespeople, then we're going to talk about their production. After that, I'm going to ask some pretty basic questions. How long have you been doing this? Um, in terms of, uh, there's a couple categories. One, I'm assuming you're asking me this because you want outbound, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm going to ask, is anybody generating outbound leads? Period. Okay. Yes or no? Yes. Great. How many? What's the consistency? That kind of stuff. No. Why? That's where I'll mm. start. If it's no, okay. I'm going to say, why aren't leads being started? Because at the end of the day, win rate, what you charge, all that kind of stuff doesn't matter if you don't have leads flowing in from outbound. If outbound is what you desire to to build. Okay. Um, so I'll start there. If it's yes, then I'm going to say, meaning like, yes, they're doing outbound. I'm going to ask questions about how much, et cetera. I'm going to dig into that. If it's not consistent, I'm going to ask why. Why is it mm -hmm. not consistent? Is the activity not consistent? Uh, is it seasonality? Like, what is the thing? Are salespeople not incentivized to do consistent work? Are they paid mm -hmm. on certain commission structures, whatever? Um, and then after that, I'm probably going to dive into, great, if, if all that's good, leads are happening it's consistent, you have salespeople, then I'll start jumping into what's the win rate, okay? For outbound sales, are you doing at least a 10% conversion rate? Meaning you're okay. closing at least one out of 10 deals. That's the bare minimum. If the answer is no, then, then I know where to step in. You don't know how to close mm. outbound sales. Okay. Um, if the answer is yes, I'm doing over 10%, then I ask where at, and then we just start the process of tweaking and optimizing. And so then I okay. say, great, if the close rate's good and the lead gen is happening, then we're kind of in a good place. It's just a matter of can mm -hmm. we lift either of those. And so that's probably the line of thinking that I would do. I wouldn't get into like tech stack. I wouldn't get into pricing model all that much. I wouldn't get into like foot in the door offers or I just want to know those basic numbers, basic things. And then I can kind of okay. create a strategy around that or at least start no, like the process. A lot. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I think a lot of people probably haven't tried sales and so their their answer is a little bit different but if they have I'm asking because it's I think it's important for them to know like okay we're not getting results where yeah. do we start what do we look at what are the things that we would evaluate so so I will, um, I will say but, if it's if leads ahead. aren't where they're at but you're trying then I'm gonna say cool let's pull up in your your numbers what's the activity right you know how I do things are the outcomes yeah. happening yes or no if the answer is yes great if the answer is no mm. which is in this scenario quantity are they just doing enough activity like i talked to a they're doing like 12 million I talked to me the other day they've they're making 100 they have six salespeople. they're doing 100 dials per week for the whole team 
and they're doing a lot of emails and their their email yeah. open rates are dropping because they're sending too many emails. They have a, a deliverability issue, et cetera. So you look under the hood, you can start asking those questions. But one, they're just not even like 100 dials. I have one SDR can do 100 dials mm. a day. So one, you're just not doing enough in this particular category. And then two, you know, your email or you're having an email issue because you're sending too many emails from your domain that aren't getting open, which hurts your deliverability, which hurts your open rate in the future. And it's a twisted cycle. And so right there, if they fix those two things, you make more calls and you send more quality emails and or fix your deliverability issue, you'll probably three to four X the team. Yeah, that's really good. No, that's good stuff. So it's kind of like, are you getting some outbound appointments set or leads? Yeah. yeah. If yes, then here's track one. If you're not, then let's look at your activity, measure those things, track two. And almost always uh, it's an activity thing. If they're doing yeah, enough activity, the then it's like, okay, we're having actual issues with our scripts, with our emails, et cetera. And so, okay. Now I did see their emails and they were hot trash, but um, <laughs> we fixed those hopefully. No, that's good. Um, okay. So for a couple, I got some agencies I'm connected to that work in like pretty specific, you know, professional service type vertical, they're, so that medical, but they're like doctor offices, right? That have got the doctor, maybe a, uh, um, practice manager, manager. Yeah. yeah but then there's also like the admin or the you know whoever answers the phone or whatever but they can't get any personal phone numbers for decision makers so they're only getting access to like the office number and so a good, a good question would be like do they pivot away from the phone entirely in term because they only connect with gatekeepers or yeah. do they stick with the phone and try to come up with a, a tactic for overcoming well, before you throw it out, I would do two things. One, like the the easiest is you can find pretty much anybody's direct line. Okay. Um, so I would just say it, it needs to be a data, like you need to find better data sources. So that's one. But let's just say hypothetically they can't, and they then then I think you need to start working on your strategy for the cold call itself to get past the admin. Mm. And we've talked about this, like because we'll hit gatekeepers in our own cold calling, and so I think the the process is you got to realize their job is to stop you from getting back to whomever you want to get back to. Right. So there's a couple strategies you could do. Um, one is you make that person an advocate for you. When they're an advocate for you, you can at a bare minimum extract information. Um, next level up from a bare minimum is they get you back to a voicemail and you have at least a chance of, of them hearing your voice, et cetera. Or you, you work with them to get on the person's calendar slash get in front of them. And so I think that's what you have to do is you have to kind of start working on how do I call into the gatekeeper and make them an advocate. I'll give you an example. So I call in and say, hey, bring, 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 Sally speaking from uh, XYZ Medical Spa, whatever. Yep. Like instead of saying, hey, Sally, this is Joey with Sales Dream Nancy. I'm just trying to get a hold of Dr. Smith, right? They know the screen from that, et cetera. So what I would do is I would call in, say I would answer. I'd say uh, if Dr. Smith has a first name, hey, John, please. Uh, yeah, can I ask who's speaking? Yeah, if you could let John know that Joey's calling, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, well, Joey, what? who are you with? Yeah, uh, Joey with Sales Driven Agency. If you could let John know that I'm calling. Yeah, uh, is this a cold call? You caught me, Sally. Can I just level with you? You're doing a really good job. I know this is your job. You're doing a great job of protecting John's calendar. Um, I'm going to go ahead and gather. I'm not going to get past you because you're really good at this. So let me ask you this. Who was the last person that got through to you and how did they do it? Because mm-hmm. um, my goal is just to talk to John. I know I can help him, but I also know that you know your job is to keep me from talking to him. Even if I do have a good thing, there's a lot of people who don't have good things. So how... How can I work with you here? And then you just basically turn that into a, how can you become an advocate for Sally to be your advocate for your conversation with John? And so. Good. Yeah, you start there. Uh, Strategically speaking, if you can get to a voicemail, like oftentimes like a doctor, you're not gonna be able to talk to doctors. And and I've worked in that space before. And so if you can't get in front of a doctor, specifically because they're seeing patients all day, they're not going to be able to really answer your phone call. Sure. Then. You need to do strategies that allow you to maximize the callback. Like, okay. So something that we've actually talked about doing is we've introduced uh, 
uh, SMS and voicemail drops. And so what we're doing now, and you're not going to do, do SMS for direct mail, so interchangeable SMS and email. So basically okay. when we call someone who doesn't answer after a certain amount of time so we get their voicemail, what we do is a voicemail drop, which means it's a pre-recorded voicemail. With, um, So we call in, hit the voicemail, we drop the 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 voicemail drop in and then we send the, an email right at, at the same time basically here's mm-hmm. the kicker so that that will increase your callback rate right you drop the voicemail it's it's well polished because you've recorded it but then also you send an email hey john just drop your voicemail hope you have a chance to check it out love to grab some time with you i know you were busy my apologies right next level to that is get creative and fun with it What's okay. getting voicemails all day long? So how do you actually drop a voicemail that's creative and fun? Well, something that we're going to start testing is w- there's a uh, voiceover actors on <laughs> Fiverr. So you go to Fiverr.com okay. and you find a voiceover actor who's got like a Denzel Washington and Eddie Murphy, like uh, just a very oh, distinguished dude. voice. Have them do your, you know, obviously make it fun, but have them do your voicemail drop and you just drop that every time you call. Bro, that's so good. It's yeah. so good. So I like that so much. That. I'll let you know how it goes, but that's that's oh. something we're going to start working on. I didn't know that. That's amazing. It's really good. Um, yeah, this is Denzel Washington call. You know, like you just do something fun. <laughs> it's so good. I'm actually calling on behalf of this person. Yeah. Um, and the reason I'm calling is, and, and then basically, you know, you try to work the system that way. Could you get it from, you know, those those sites that like the celebrities do like a, yeah, a video drop? Them. I'm sure you could, could you but there might be some. And actually sort of, get that. Pro, oh, yeah. There'd be like a licensing or some kind of. Okay. Something. Anyways. But there's voiceover guys who sound pretty close. And so That's if you really could do fun. that, uh, that would be kind of cool. Like Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg would be really fun. There you go. <laughs> D-O-G. Um, all right. Here's a really specific question that I just I want a quick thought on. So I uh, ran into a sales rep. The feedback from their manager or their boss, whoever, the CEO was. Hey, great salesperson, conversationalist, like understands how the nuances of consultative sales, can do all the things, good on the phone, doesn't doesn't write emails well. <laughs> like their yeah. their understanding of the English language is a little rough. Deficient. <laughs> That's right. So it made me think of like it, I'm not asking you to answer that specific question, but like every sales rep is going to have some gaps in their yeah. ability to perform. How do you identify those and then stop? Don't don't even say. It. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> how do you identify what? Uh, how do you identify those specific? I mean, that's a pretty like it's in your face if they don't write good English like gram- grammar emails. But like, how do you identify those gaps and then how do you strategically think for filling those or, or providing trainings that meet those needs? Um. Well, I think that's why we when we do our hiring process. It, we have homework that they write as part of the homework. They have to write a cold email and they have to yep. give us a cold call script that they would use so I can think. And then you're also having interviews with them. So you see how they carry themselves on a call. Right. So like a lot of those things can vet out some people, but then there's just some people who slip through. I don't know that it's like a, de- like a deficiency finding strategy. I just think that there's a, if you're a good manager, leader, coach, whatever, like you are seeing you should be having transparency into what's happening. Like I can, Mm. if you use the CRM, the way that we build CRMs, if you use the tools, the way we build tools, like you will see every email that goes out. If you go looking for it, you will get a call recording of every call that's ever happened. If you go looking for it, you'll see the amount of activity they're doing. Like you keep a pulse on it pretty quickly. And, and if it's like an email, email is a pretty easy solution. It's like, Hey, we will build five to six commonly used templates You've got to yep. use them. You can alter them slightly, but just now the good thing is we have like sales assistants who do know how to write. <laughs> so <laughs> they can just send the emails for them would be my solution. But mm-hmm. I think that, you know, if it's a hindrance, then I think you need to put some templates or, or frameworks in place to make sure. I don't really know that. That's, that's, that's my best advice. That's a good an- no, it's a good answer. Um, you mentioned management, like good managers. So I think we have a lot of founders, CEOs who have to manage salespeople once they hire them and probably have no idea how. So like yes. if you had to give a handful of principles, 
what do good sales managers do if somebody's trying to think for how to do that effectively? Um, yeah, management's hard because it's multifaceted, as we've always talked about. There's three different levels. But I think that it's also a commitment to consistency. Like you can't be a part, like you can't be a, uh, an inconsistent manager, right? Mm. Yeah. As much as you want to like pop in when things are breaking or you want things to always go smoothly and you're just coming in to optimize every now and then, like you got to realize that people, people business, like there's managers for projects, project management, there's yep. management for account management, there's management for finance. Like why would you not have a regular consistent mm-hmm. cadence to manage your sales team? And so if you have regular meetings and regular reviews, the difference between a meeting and a review is a meeting is with people. A review is a meeting with yourself to prepare for your meeting with people. Yep. And so if you have those two elements and you're consistent and they're always on the calendar, you're at least being consistent with your touch points. Um, Mm. And then scripting out what you do in those meetings, your agenda for those meetings, the things you need to prepare for those meetings allows you to be successful. Um, and, and to be a good manager, leader, and or coach, that's the first, like that's the number one battle you got is just the consistency game. So if you can literally yeah. just put things on calendars, you're going to be ahead of 90% of most people who call themselves founder managers. Yep. And so if you do that and you have the tools to be successful, so when I say tools, I mean like you have the dashboards that tell you your sales department or salesperson KPIs. If you have a shutdown scorecard that your salespeople have to fill out every single day, it is a requirement. If you miss three of them, I fire you, right? Like if you have those things in place, you have most of the data you need. If you combine that with being consistent and you review the data, it's hard to mess up. Like, will you be the most optimal, 100% perfect? No, but you'll be better than most. That's where I would say people need to start instead of getting like, here's the perfect framework. It's like have daily scorecards, have dashboards, have meetings that you meet with your, every salesperson at least once a week and have reviews where you review the scorecards, the dashboards and prepare for the meetings you have with your people. And be consistent. And be consistent. Just put it on the calendar, yeah. make it recurring. You don't miss it. It's important. Mm. It is important. It's, it's incredibly it's important. Good. As you've known with a lot of our clients, like a lot of our clients, the ones who are not having the most success, we have found the biggest deficiency is their ability to manage and lead. For sure. For sure. And we're we are now coaching that. them significantly better on how to be a manager. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, so thinking about SDA, um, I was thinking about this the other day, like a few years ago, two, two and a half years ago. I mean, we were fighting to be a million dollar company, right? Yep. And have since gone blown by that and have really large aspirations. Um, there are probably a lot of people listening to this who are scrapping, clawing, trying to get to a million dollars. Um, but their their sights are so set on that that like their their beliefs are limited. They're not looking yeah. beyond the seven figure agency. And so uh, we've got a community of people that have blown past seven figures. They've built successful multi seven figure eight figure agencies. Tell everybody why they would benefit eventually if they're big enough, if they're qualified sure. to join the best damn agency. And I'll knock this ad read out quite differently. You're gonna crush this. Yes, I will. So. What Jay talked about is there is there's a level of secrets and and information that as you get bigger and better in whatever your category, there is information that that you possess that everyone below you typically does not. And so what we have created is the ability to have the key to go unlock that information through a community of people. And so JJ and I have assembled a community of digital agency CEOs who have accomplished a lot of what you guys who are listening to this probably want to accomplish or you're currently accomplishing and you want to be around people who are also doing that because the rising tide lifts all ships. So we have built the best damn agency mastermind, which is a collective of digital agency CEOs doing between two and 20 million in revenue. And they have the information, they have the keys to success uh, and the things that have historically been lock and key at the top, you now have access to through proximity to these people. And we have created an environment where everyone there is a giver. No matter what level you're at, the $20 million is giving to the $2 million agency. The $2 million agency has figured out things that the $20 million agency hasn't. And they're giving each other the secrets to building a successful agency, if not the best damn agency. And so we have built this mastermind just for people like that who want to give 
who have things to give to their community, but also who want to receive, be sharpened, cut corners just simply by having the cheat codes, um, but also who want to be better people. It's not just about building a better business. It's not just about having more revenue and bottom line. It's about having more impact, uh, having more uh, influence on your market, influence on your home. Can you be a better father? Can you be a better husband? Can you be a better community member? If you want to be in a community of people who have done big things, who are sharing big things that you don't have access to, come join us. Check us out at www.bestdamnagency.co. Again, www.bestdamnagency.co. Check out the video. Apply to have a conversation with us. There's no harm in a conversation. We'll let you know if it's potentially a good fit. And you'll know pretty quickly if this is the community you want to be a part of. It's a little better. It was fantastic. You did great. Thanks, 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 thanks. We've done Tahoe. We're doing the Dominican. A while back, we did Scottsdale. Um, mm-hmm. What's next, man? Uh, Antarctica. <laughs> yeah, be damn Alaska. <laughs> no, I don't know. I think, All right, wait, uh, hold on. Wait, wait. I, so here, listen to this, though, this premise. Have okay. you seen the show Alone? Yes. What if we all got dropped off with eight <laughs> supplies we could pick? I know a few guys who would die in the first week. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and I know a few guys who would probably be living out there. Uh, I'm probably days one of them. I'm one of them. Yeah, oh, I'd dude. probably like, if I could bring an AR-15, that'd be great. But if I had to like do other stuff, <laughs> yeah, it's I'd like, probably last longer because I have more like insulation and fat on me. I'd last longer. Just I could starve myself for a while and still live. Oh, dude. I, I like that show a lot. I've only watched I'm one always, season a long time ago, but I'm always impressed. The guy that like saved the, he saved like the moose testicles and like used the fat <laughs> from the, I, I'm like, dude, what are you doing? Kills a, uh, what is it? The, like a mongoose or some shit like that. Uh, I want to say a honey badger. That's not, that's what wolverine. it was. A wolverine. Mm. Yeah. Wolverines are freaking gnarly. insane. Gnarly. All yeah. right. I mentioned the, the kind of scaling past the seven figures into the multi, seven figures and headed towards eight um a while back i mean you had this kind of you you mentioned like a limiting belief like i could never Mm -hmm. build a 50 million dollar company or whatever sure so we we've set our sights on large goals i feel like we're i mean every day like now that you've got some more space to dream for offers and what you know what sda could be um, you know you come back and you're like i mean this could be the thing that takes us to 75 million or whatever Mm -hmm. like you've always got these new ideas so we are on that trajectory of growth and scale, one yes. that we had not previously attempted. And it's been really fun. We've had a lot of success. It's also been super hard. My question is, how are you feeling about that endeavor that you have set yourself on? Yeah, uh, I enjoy it. So I think for me, the, the, and the and probably a lot of you guys have wrestled with this, or at least you will at some point, there's always this tearing between do I want a lifestyle company where I make three to five hundred thousand a year i work 10 hours a week and you know i do high margin work i don't have a big team to manage etc and then there's like i want to build an enterprise where big team big numbers big scale big decisions all that stuff and i think for me i always would get caught in the middle where like i felt like and maybe you guys feel this way too where i felt like lifestyle business taking care of my lifestyle where I kind of get to live life on my terms uh, it, it makes sense in theory but when you actually live it it's boring if you're a builder and then there's hmm. enterprise where it's like I don't want to have a bunch of people that I have to manage and I don't want to go through the middle portion that I don't want to go through hmm. where you're like less profitable making more money top line but your bottom line small and you have that question of like I could just make lower top line but have really high bottom line and make the same amount as I'm making right now except with all the headaches gone. Hmm. And I'd always get to that middle ground, that couple million, you know, area where it's like I'm not quite the CEO, but I'm also like trying to hire people and let them have responsibility. I'm not I don't have the lifestyle business anymore cuz like I'm making the same as if I was doing a million in revenue with a few people. And so I kept hitting this point. And every time I'd hit this, I'd just be like, fuck it. I want to go back to do a lifestyle thing. At least that's easier and less stressful. Sure. And I think the tipping point for me was I felt like I had to be the massive integral part for us mm. to get past that middle ground, that middle place. And um, 
I think what I learned is, is no, it comes down to reinvesting in the right people who can take us past that awkward middle place, who know how to push through the bullshit, who know how to deal with people, who know how to hire and onboard employees and train. And also like making sure that your core values are super aligned, that everyone on the bus is, is, is excited about the direction, gets the direction, wants to contribute to the direction. That was the big turning point for mm. me is realizing I don't have to be the one to get us past. Like obviously I'm integral still. I'm still very important as the CEO, but there are far better operators who know how to get you through the sludge that gets you on the other side of that where it's like, oh, now we're hitting scale and growth and, and we're adding new offers and we have the freedom to do that. I still guess say we're wasn't. on the tail end of that. Guess who wasn't that season. person? <laughs> do what? I said, guess who wasn't that next level operator? Who? Me. You? <laughs> yes, that's for yeah. sure. Uh, but no, that's been, uh, that's been probably the biggest thing for me. And so I think a lot of you, like the self-limiting belief is I can't build a big company because I don't want to get past this middle mm. thing. I don't know if I can. I'm, I'm not a good manager of people. I can't hire people the right way. Well, then don't. And find the right yeah. people who can do that. Um, and be willing to to reinvest in that. Like there were, I could easily pay myself six figures a month in some months, and instead I didn't. I just paid myself my regular base salary, and I reinvested in hiring the right people. And those right people went and hired the other right people. And you know, even hiring and firing, I don't have to do anymore necessarily. So I think that's the thing. Yeah, you have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do it for your department. Oh, uh, that was the day that I quit. Went to my wife. Yeah. It's not yeah. fun, man. Firing firing good people, like just good hearted people, is hard. They're just not the right fit. It's very unfortunate. Yep. <sighs> Hold on one second. Yeah. Well, anyway, so the, you guys listening, don't don't let the middle ground stop you from going to yeah. the high ground. Yeah. If that if, if lifestyle business bores you, which it does for like true builders, visionaries, and creators, then you you just got to push past the middle. And that middle is going to make you want to go back to being a lifestyle business, but just know when you go back to being a lifestyle business, you're going to be bored of shit. Yeah. I, so I don't think I told you this, and, and I didn't really plan to share this, but it just came to mind. So this was two weeks ago. I was meeting with my coach, and I'm, and we had just had Taylor Welsh, uh, Traffic yeah. and Funnels, all the other impressive stuff. He'd came and talked to our mastermind and was like a wizard. Dude's a freaking wizard. He's amazingly smart. You and I are not business And every partners. time... Uh, what are y'all doing? Tell me about it. I can't talk about it yet. It's not fully it top, stealth stealth mode. Top secret. No, nah, he just wants help with something he's doing. Okay. All right. Well, so anytime I hear somebody like that, talk about these like massive things that they're building and like their portfolio of multiple businesses and the hundreds of millions they're generating. I'm like, dude, that appeals to me. Like I, there's mm -hmm. what's funny is you and I are, we've looked at our, I mean, you're, you're, you have more of like an assertiveness than I do, but we're wired very similarly in how we think about work. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite as like massively high on the visionary scale, but I'm still yeah, yeah. like, I slant, slant that way. And so I see these things. I'm like, that excites me. Like what doesn't excite me is doing the same thing for more than like three to four years. Like I just don't get excited yes. about that at all. Yep. Or doing one thing. I'd rather do like a bunch of things and have them be really fun and set up other people to, to run those things. So I asked my coach, I'm like, hey, the majority of people that I've seen that do this have terrible work-life balance. Their marriages are very average. They don't get to see their kids very much. Like, help me think through this. Mm -hmm. Like, do I need to, if I'm wanting to spend a ton of time with my kids while they're young, like, do I need to reconsider the way that I've get excited about business, right? Yeah. And he's, he's like, maybe you're just looking at the wrong people, dude okay, that's, that's a challenging idea. Um, yep. And so he's like, well, why don't you just think of like three people that you know that have built eight-figure, nine-figure business portfolios, but who like you really respect their the rest of everything else they do. Hmm. Well, all right, I've got a few people that I could think of. And so I call up the dude who, uh, I don't want to name drop him at all because he's, he's yeah. an older gentleman. But he, let's say this, he helped found and then ran uh, one of the largest uh, hotel chains, you would know the name if I said it yeah. in, in the, in the United States. And so call this dude up. He's a family friend. And I'm like, Hey man, here's where I'm at. And, um, it was really good just to talk through like, what do I want? How does that mesh with 
my principles and core values. And it is possible to scale up massive businesses and be a part of huge business portfolios and, and like do multiple yeah. things all at one time if you do it the right way. And if, if the main, like I think what's happened for me, and we talked about this at the very beginning of the show, so it kind of comes full circle is I've sort of just lost sight of like what is nuclearly core to me? Like what are my core mm-hmm. convictions? Central. Um, I liked what I said better. It nuclearly. Cool. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. This is, hey, I'm the host of this podcast. You're right. Um, You're right. <laughs> so I think I've, I've, I've deviated even just a few degrees, but downrange that few degree deviation creates a massive separation from where you thought you would end up. Uh, and so his thing was like, dude, pursue all the things. Mm-hmm. Like, why settle for, for small? Why settle for mediocre? Like, go big, but just make sure that you're maintaining those like nuclear core convictions. And so I think I'm like halfway there. Uh, yeah. And that would be my encouragement to anybody that's like, dude, what do I want? Do I want a lifestyle business? Do I want, do I want to build big? I mean, you're one of the yeah. people that I've seen, you've wrestled with it, but I've seen you do a, a pretty good job of like, you know, you keep your family really core to who you are and like you work on your marriage and you work on yourself and you work on your, like, you've got a life coach and a business coach. Like you, you work on those yeah. things. Um, but I would just say, don't lose those things in pursuit of building something massive and impressive because you'll you'll not like who you are at the end of the day. Yeah, I was, I was literally but, yesterday actually speaking to Taylor here. Now we're talking, and um, because he's actually he's actually mentioned because he went through a big transition recently with just like yeah, I kind of went all in on the business thing, and I'm realizing that he's got a three year old about to be four year old daughter. And oh, that's cool. That's cool. You know, he's kind of looking at her like. I've got only a couple of years of this with her and, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's no business thing. So, but what I talked to him about is like the, the mindset that I think that I've had a shift in over the past couple of years is I'm an all in guy. And so I'm, I want to be like, I'm not a big believer in like work life balance in the sense that I just want to chill. And I also want to work a little bit and I want to have a bit, you know, my home thing. It's like, no, I want to go fucking balls to the wall while I work. I'm not going to leave yeah. my office. I'm not going to think about my kid. I'm not going to think about my wife. I'm here to build. Hmm. But the moment that I turn off and I have a process for turning off, I'm going balls to the wall as a dad, as a husband, as a whatever I have to be that day. And hmm. I don't believe in balance. I just believe in like run to that spectrum, run to that end of the pendulum and then run back. And then your goal should be that every night when I hit the pillow, I'm fucking exhausted because that's what I'm supposed to do as a man. Yeah. Or a woman or whoever have you, you have you seen uh, <laughs> I identify. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but there's another what's the, there's another phrase. Um oh, it's not I identify as. It's like I'm not manifest. I can't think of it. There's another no. way to say that. I was laughing about it earlier. Um no. I had a thought. I can't remember it. Was it a good it's one? Fine. Anyways. Yeah, it was it's pretty good. A lot of people are like, oh, I want to preserve it. No, there's a, there's a Go show. Ahead. There's a show right now. I, okay. I have not seen it, but it's a movie, I think, about a drug they develop. It's either a movie or a show that allows you to, like, your brain, you have, like, a work consciousness that is 100% separate from your, it's a, uh, like, it's like a chip from your home Business. consciousness. Interesting. So when you go to work, you can't remember, you don't even know who your wife is. You're, like, a different mm-hmm. person. Yep. And then when you go home, you don't remember work. You're a totally different person. Uh, apparently, it leaves room for like lots of moral dilemmas and all kinds of things. <laughs> okay. A good show does, but yes, I'm sure it does. And that's, but then there's like the in between where it's like I'm thinking when I'm like thinking about what I want, I'm thinking about work in the vein of how does it affect my family. But when I'm actually in the yes. office to to execute on that plan, I don't think about it all that much, right? And so like. I stay in here. I do my thing. And then at five o'clock, nearly every day I shut off. Yeah. And, uh, and I've also made some rules, you know, to kind of put the boundaries on it. And it is hard, but like leave your phone plugged in somewhere else and you can check on it once or twice a night. But when you leave the office, you go home and you balls to the wall, be a dad and a husband or a mom yeah. and, a, and a wife. Right. And so whatever your thing is. And so, I just think that I think that we live in a culture where like the goal is not to put your head on your pillow and just be completely spent for the day. Like our goal is like energy preservation. Yeah. Whereas I think that we should be like 
our, however many hours we're awake, 16, 18 hours is all about energy depletion. And then you go to sleep because you've given everything, mm-hmm. you, you know, the whole football phrase of leave it on the field kind of thing. Like just leave it on the field and, and you will rest when you put your head down. Speaking of leave it on the field, I will be at the field this Saturday. Which when the one? Notre Dame Fighting Irish take on the Ohio State Buckeyes. When do you fly out? Yeah. Uh, it's a three-hour drive. It's not far. Wait, really? Oh, Ohio. That's yeah. right. It's in Columbus. Columbus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm nervous. So, Oh, it's going to be terrible, actually. No, it's not. We're going to get our asses kicked. Yeah, No, we we're are. not. Not with that attitude. Or I guess with I'm that gonna attitude. believe that we're gonna get our asses kicked because I have zero input on the outcome of the game. And True. then if they win, it'll be fantastic. So Yeah. That's what era. I choose. I I choose that. Um I gotta go tell a guy that we were gonna hire that was our second option that I really like that we're not gonna hire him. So that's, that's what nice. I gotta go do real quick. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's cool. But we'll we'll hire him for something else. But this has been fun, man. Always. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks to those of you who have hung out with us uh, that have really kind of like rode with us through uh, the thick and the thin, Joey's shitty ad reads. We appreciate you. It was, um, <laughs> it was not your best, but we will see you as always back here next week for next week's edition of the Best Damn Agency Podcast. Please do us a favor. We don't need your petty favors, but if you like the podcast, rate, review, subscribe. It makes us feel good. It makes us want to come back here and keep serving you guys. Uh, we appreciate your time and attention. Until then, uh, until next week, see you later. Peace out. Question everything.